Hello and thank you for joining us for the next Vintage Legends instalment. Uh, I'm Graham from the Vintage Guitar Players Group. Uh, if you want to find us, you can have a look on facebook.com slash groups slash the vintage place. Remember to hit subscribe below. And of course, if you want to find us on Instagram, you can also find us at 95 Vintage Legends. So today I'm here with Matt Smith from Chicago, Illinois, from Hard Rock Act, Fast Susie. So first right. of all, thank you very, very much for your, your time and, and support today, Matt. Thanks for having me. I very appreciate, much appreciate it. Very much appreciated. So to get uh, things uh, on the go, first of all, if you can tell us just a bit more about uh, the music you guys play. It is kind of like classic hard rock, late 70s into the mid 80s, uh, just before the explosion of the hair bands, when um, guitar solos were a little more important than the hairspray. Um, <laughs> I um, I grew up on that kind of music um, and uh, it, all guitar heavy hard rock, everything from Mark Boland to Ace Fraley to Gary Richrath to Gary Moore yeah. um, to Dave Manichetti from the band Y&T. And the music is styled a little bit like that. Um, we have a new singer who brings a completely different dimension uh, to the band. His name is uh, Dennis, and he's from Eastern Europe and was in a very popular band in Moldova and Ukraine and, and, and played quite a bit in that area. And it's a little bit more modern, but we're incorporating a few of those songs and kind of making it our own. It's, it's a little different. And um, it's a nice kind of cross-section of different kinds of hard rock. Yeah, that's pretty awesome. And quite far, far traveled then from going from Moldova to, to Chicago. Eh? Yeah, it, yeah, it's, um, you know, he's relatively new, so we don't know the whole story, but, um, he's, a he's a great singer. I don't think he left out of any negative reasons. I think his family just emigrated to the U.S. Okay. And, um, he's a great singer. He's a great songwriter. He's a great guitar player. Doesn't want to play guitar in the band. He just wants to sing. <laughs> Um, but, uh, and, and look, it's fine. You gotta, you gotta be happy in the band however you want. So I'm not about to force him to play guitar just because I think it would look and sound kind of interesting. Okay. So, you know, it is what it is. It is a twin guitar band anyway. So I have a lot of opportunity to experiment, um, tone wise so that it's not two guitars with the same kind of tone. Yeah. Um, the other guitar player, Mark Schuth, is a little bit more of a shredder, you know, the mid to late 80s yeah. kind of guy. Um, so he's got the ultra high gain amps and the iPhone as guitars, where I'm kind of the old school guy, where I have the older Marshalls. I do have a, a JVM 410, but I use that really more for cleans than anything else. Yeah. So I so switch back and forth between the two. So just kind of temper things a little. It's Again, you know, a pretty, a pretty good approach to getting a nice balanced sound, so fair play to you, you know. Yeah, and, um, yeah. And with, uh, with obviously Vintage, how did you, you know, come across Vintage in the first place? I read an article somewhere online. I want to say it might have been in um, oh, um, PremierGuitar.com. Okay. .com. And um, it was about the Peter Green... V100. And I'm a, a, a big fan of Gary Moore, learned backwards about Peter Green, because Peter's era of Fleetwood Mac uh, happened, I was two. So, um, you know, I, I, I learned backwards, I take my guitar heroes, if you will, and learn who influenced them and try to absorb it as much of that as possible. I fell in love with that out of phase sound. Uh, yeah, yeah. And um, I was working in the industry when I read this. I, um, I worked for a company that sold websites to music stores. And okay. we sold computer systems, ERP systems to manufacturers. And so we had a booth at NAMM. I walked over to the vintage booth, absolutely fell in love with pretty much everything. <laughs> Sat down and played it. I felt like I was that kid at Guitar Center just amazed at how well they played. 
Um, I've never been really a gear snob, so I didn't say, well, it doesn't have the right name on the headstock. Um, these just feel great. And they sounded great with the amps that were there. And all I could think about is how is it going to sound in my rig? Um, in 2018, I was in a, a tribute band to the band Ario Speedwagon. And I had started discussions with uh, Rick at RBI, the American distributor, about somehow getting a double cutaway V100 made. And in this tribute band, we were going for as much authenticity as possible. And um, so that's how it all started. Uh, I got very busy with the band doing shows around the country. That got shelved. And then um, a couple of years ago, I, uh, poor Rick, is, is hundreds of emails from me uh, <laughs> asking about this model, asking about this model. And one of the guitars I've always wanted was a beat-up Telecaster. Very much, um, you know, I know there are people like, oh, just like Bruce Springsteen. My inspiration was Roy Buchanan okay. and Billy Squire. And um, I, uh, I got to see Billy's rig up close at a show in um, 1983. And the sound of his 52 Telecaster through his Marshall rig uh, was amazing. Yeah. And then there were there were bands in the 80s that did that. The band Cinderella, the yeah. singer, played a, a, a Telecaster, a butterscotch tele, through his Marshalls, and it sounded amazing. It didn't obviously it didn't sound like a Les Paul. It didn't sound like a Strat. It didn't sound like the country guitar that you know, so many people, you know, yes. country music that so many people associate with a Telecaster. So Rick and I had a couple of conversations about it. And eventually I got my, uh, my V52 and it's hard to put down. Um, I am, uh, anybody who knows me will tell you, I don't know how many guitars I own that are completely stock. I'm, I'm a, a, a modder. I'm a, uh, I tweak everything to hell. And I think all that we did on this guitar was Rick sent me another set of tuners just to see which ones were smoother between the two. Okay. Um, but I haven't done a thing. The pickups are great. The, the feel of the guitar is fantastic. Um, no neck sprout, which to me was amazing because I've seen more expensive guitars than this one with neck sprout. I saw um, a Gibson Explorer that had neck sprout, yeah. you know, the fret sprout rather. Um, no sharp frets on this thing at all. And it plays great. Acoustically, it's really loud, which impressed me. And um, I couldn't be happier. I don't use it all the time, but um, I use this more than I thought I would. Because I thought it would be a great addition and anytime I wanted to, you know, noodle around you know, with some blues or, or, you know, play some Billy Squire stuff, which I enjoy. Um, you know, I thought that this would be good for those times. I'm playing it in the band. So, yeah, yeah it works out really well. I don't know. You mentioned, uh, obviously, a little earlier, you were uh, potentially looking at getting a B100 before the end of the year. You're interested in getting one of the lemon drops, you say, then? Yeah, my hope and um, my my pocketbook Hope that uh, by the end of the year, I'll have three or four more. Um, awesome. I, I want to, I want a lemon drop. Um, Rick and I had been talking about a, um, a V6 for use with a guitar synthesizer. Cool. And, um, you know, there's a lot to choose from. I actually want, uh, and I'm going to forget the model numbers, VSA 500. The yeah. uh, semi-acoustic. Yeah, I want the one in black. Um, nice. Because it reminds me of B.B. Of King's Lucille. Yeah. It's got the black inlays. And I had a conversation with Kevin Easton, who does a lot of the setup and, and mod work for yeah. Vintage for sure. here. Yeah, he's, the, he's a great guy. And, and he agreed to install a, a Veritone in it, cool. just for authenticity. Um I have the very good fortune of knowing one of B.B. King's daughters who happens to live here. Right. And yeah, and, and, and she's a great person. And, and, and it's a, um, it's kind of fun playing. I have a, a 335, 
which is fun to play. I don't, that's not useful in the band. That thing, I plug it into the Marshalls and it feeds back. I don't have to yeah. do anything. But um, I thought it would be kind of fun. And that's on my radar for the end of the year too. Um, you know, if, if the band takes off, like I hope, and we've been stalled because of COVID like the rest of the world, yeah. but if it does take off and, and we're blessed to have uh, a decent following, my hope is that maybe next year I can talk to Rick and to um, a signature mom. I have a, a couple of ideas, nothing groundbreaking, but things that I think I would really enjoy that aren't necessarily stock. Well, um, two questions I might have on that then. Before we go into signature models, the lemon drop, would you be going for the brand new, nice and shiny, glossed up out the box version or the icon version, the distressed one? No, the icon version. <laughs> the icon version. I really like I, I really like the non icon one in fairness as well. It's, it's really well, nice. you know what, they're they're both great. <laughs> I I I try very hard to take good care of my gear. Yeah. Um and uh the idea of having a brand spanking new guitar that I come off the stage and realize I've gouged would kill me for days. <laughs> I, when I was in, in high school, I, uh, I bought a Gibson Les Paul in 1981, brand new. Yeah. And, um, I, I remember going to the, um, to the guitar shop and it was a, a tiny shop in the city that was out of the way and it was run by a, a, a blues player. And, uh, my mom, of course I was 14. 81. Yeah, I was uh, 15 going on 16. And we went into this tiny little store, my mom and I. And my mom just goes, we want to get him a guitar. First guitar that um, he brought out was a 79 anniversary Strat. Okay. And now that I look at what they're going for. Yeah. I <laughs> wish you like, that. <laughs> and I don't think I said no before he got fully in the room. And um, then his next guitar was a Les Paul in uh, what they used to call Tobacco Sunburst. Yeah. And the, the the shop owner looked at me like I was crazy. Why don't you want the Strat? And I was like, Ace Fraley doesn't play a Strat. <laughs> and that was, you know, that was the start of it. But that was brand new in the case. And about two months in, was when I discovered what buckle rash is. <laughs> and, I, you know, I, I look, I'm 15, 16 years old. I take the guitar, you know, at the end of the day, and I'm wiping down the strings, you know, like everybody says you're supposed to, but nobody really does. And polishing the guitar every night, I swear to God, it slept in the bed with me. <laughs> and, and, I mean, it gleamed, like, like the day it came out of, out of the factory. And, um, we did, uh, the band I was in then had played a party and I got home and was doing my, my nightly thing of wiping it down. And there was a gash in the back and a couple of imprints from, from the belt buckle. And I about cried for two days. <laughs> it's brutal. Well, I, uh, so, I, I know that pain all too well because I remember, um, we were in about 18 at the time and had, uh, Jackson Dinky black okay. Jackson Dinky, nice upside down pointy headstock and all the rest of it and one of my friends had been borrowing it because I had a couple of guitars thankfully at that time and this this friend, nice nice guy amazing family, he actually came across from Iran um, and went to college with him and he had this look in his face when I came up to see him one time and he's like listen I'm really 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 sorry, I'm like oh, what's up man it's like, no, I've really got, really got to apologise. Oh, what's up? It's like, like the guitar that my sister knocked over and it's chipped the back of the headstock. It's like, oh, it's fine. It's a Jackson. It's pointy headstock. That's going to happen at some point, man. Don't worry about it, you know? <laughs> but inside, you were crying and wanted to kill him, right? Well, I don't know. It wasn't that bad. But uh, no, it's just anything with any kind of points, you know, yourself, like, you know, yeah, they're, they're just going to get that happen at some point and sit in the back. You can't even see it. It's cool, you know? <laughs> yeah, well... Yeah, you just keep telling yourself it's not yeah. there. You look anything, at it like from the front. Any, anything in the front door, like you know, that would be like. Oh, yeah. But yeah, 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 right, definitely. So signature model, then probably one thing I would be very curious in finding out. Then if you had to 
come up with any kind of model of your own, any kind of dream vintage, any kind of signature model? What what's it going to look like? What are we going to see? Are we going to see that double cut? Or are we going to see something different? Um, I you know I hadn't thought about the double cut. I I thought about <laughs> um, and that that brings up an interesting idea. But no, uh, the the platform would be a V one hundred, and um, perhaps a little bit more of a neck carve. Okay. where I can reach the higher frets. Okay. Um, I would like a, a flatter fingerboard. Okay. Or 14, 16, okay. as opposed to uh, a 12. Uh, just because every guitar that I've played with that radius fingerboard feels really good. It's very different from everything else. The only problem is um, every guitar that I've played with that kind of fingerboard radius has 24 frets. Yeah. I'm not a fan of it. And it's a really stupid reason because I grew up with the Les Paul in 22 frets. Yeah. I don't always look where I'm playing. So I know where I am in relation to where my hand is against the neck. So if I'm playing something in, let's say, at the 14th fret, F sharp, um, on a Les Paul, my hand is in a certain position. I know where I'm at. Yeah. On a 24 fret guitar, I'm not in the same place. And I've had a couple of Jacksons with 24 fret guitars. I mean, 24 frets. And um, more than once, I would start a solo in the wrong key <laughs> because I didn't look. Yeah. And every time that happened, the next day I sold that guitar. Um, the only guitar that I own that has 24 frets is a Steinberger because okay. there's no such thing as a 22 fret Steinberger. So, yeah. um, and it was one of those they're kind of cool. I couldn't see myself using it, uh, you know, but, um, and it's one of the newer ones. It's not really, you know, one of the old ones with the carbon fiber and all that. It's one of the ones that are actually made by Epiphone now. Yeah. And, um, and they're nice. Um, the only other thing that I would like, um, I mean, I've got lots of ideas. I, I never know how feasible they are, but um, I really would like either a very dark rosewood or, an ebony fingerboard. Okay. I used to have a, a Les Paul um, studio that had an ebony fingerboard and it was great. It just felt so much different. Um, and, um, you know, I, I think I mentioned earlier, I'm a little bit of a gear whore and I try to experiment and all this and that. And I, I keep thinking about a sustainer. The only problem is okay. sustainers hack out you know, you have to carve a lot out of the back of a guitar yeah, yeah. to accommodate the wiring. It's not, you can't really run them into the channels yeah. that the pickups and the, and the, um, the tone controls are. So um, I'm, I'm not a fan of chambered guitars. So the idea of carving out the guitar, the whole point of something like that is that wood is, is the basis of the tone. That's where the soul of the guitar is, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. But that's what I'd look for. That's cool. What kind of finish would you be thinking? I'm thinking about black, or like a chrome kind of black, a little bit of a sheen to it. Yeah, okay, so, than, yeah. You know, um, not like not like a Jackson black, but like a, a really a really well painted, um, you know, ebony, and in nitrocellulose rather than a lacquer well, well, you know, rather than the, the poly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Interesting. I, I have a couple of guitars that, that have poly. I, I, ironically, I have a, a Fender Strat that's, uh, I think they call it the classic 70s. So it, okay. it looks a lot like a 70s um, Strat. It's heavy. It's got the huge headstock, but it looks like it's been dipped in poly. Yeah. And so I took a scotch Bright pad to the back of it to knock some of that off. But that part of me that, that hates the whole buckle rash thing, um, <laughs> I won't touch the body. Because I'm like, you get keep it nice. You know, nobody can see the back of the neck where it's, you know, it's intentionally scuffed out. So, yeah, no, that makes sense. That's, I mean, yeah. It, I mean, that's some basic thoughts. And I'm sure Rick will tell me we can't do that. Can't do that, and I'll go. Okay, well, let's try this. <laughs> so, what can we do? You know, we uh, we had been talking about um, a V120 in that really traditional sunburst. 
you know, where it goes from the brown to that really bright yellow. Yeah. And uh, apparently it's only available where you are. And I don't, uh, you know, everything is, is sales oriented. And he wasn't sure that that, that would particularly sell and, and he knows a lot more about what will sell here and, and, and whatnot. But um, that's been, um, that's been on my radar for a while. Somebody will sell them when used at some point. Yeah. So, you know, um, but I happen to love those um, immensely. Either that we'll have to get one shot for you. <laughs> we'll sell some. <laughs> oh, I, um, I, I'm sure somebody at, uh, at JHS would, would love to figure out a way to, you know, access my visa, which, you know, is <laughs> understandable. But, yeah. Well, we can see. I would, uh, I'd be looking forward to see what else you've got lined up if you're going to be speaking to Kevin as well. Then it'd be pretty cool. Um, yeah. Obviously, with things, you know, new singers and kind of, been writing and building up ahead of steam with things. What have you got lined up then for recording and gigging and what's what's in the pipe work? So we've taken the attitude of it takes as long as it takes. Yeah. Um, you know, we're older now. This isn't my career. Back when I was in my, my 20s and early 30s, this was my career. I was a, a hired gun musician. I, I played, I used to say I play guitar and bands for singers that you either never heard of or you wish you hadn't, but the money <laughs> was good. Um, you know, I would live off per diem and, and back in the, in the eighties, the only way you could send money quickly was Western union. And I would Western union, my mom, all the money to hold on to. And I would live off my per diem. Sometimes it was like 50, $60 a day. Yeah. So, you know, that, that all worked out. Now we all have, jobs, real world jobs and families and, you know, all the pressures that come to that. So I'm not in the mindset that we have to go out and, and record an album and go play. Uh, we're almost ready to go out and play. I've talked to a few people who um, are a little bit more of an expert in marketing um, to help me relaunch this band. Uh, this band actually started over 30 years ago. Um, I am the only original member left. I like to tell people we're kind of like foreigner <laughs> where, you know, but I'll play all the gigs. Um, I, sometimes I joke that we're like the Statler brothers, the country uh, outfit where there is only one Statler brother yeah. left in the band. <laughs> um, so, and we had a, a moderate degree of success uh, in the Chicago area. We flew a little bit under the radar, which was fine. Um, if for whatever reason, even though we all wanted to be rock stars, I kind of thought of it as a business first and figured if somebody liked me enough to, I don't know, ask for an autograph or something, then that was just really icing on the cake. I got to do something that I loved. Um, we had recorded two albums, uh, well, actually one album and a live EP from a very famous club in, in the Chicago area that doesn't exist anymore. And um, you can actually still get, I think you can still get them in Japan. Um, I had signed a distribution deal back in 2008. There was a company that asked me if they could license one of the songs for a compilation album. And that led to them asking if they could license the whole thing. And I still occasionally get royalty checks. I mean, they're like 18 cents, but, you know. <laughs> It's better than your pocket than someone else's, you know. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I I started just handing them to my kids going, this is your allowance. <laughs> you know, don't spend it all in one place. But of course, that wasn't met with smiles. But, you know, um, and so the band went dormant for a while and I was doing other things. And in um, 2019, I started to, I started to think I, I had gotten burnt out of being in this tribute band. I mean, we did very well. I was very very fortunate a lot of people liked what I did in that band um, we toured the US and it was it was a lot of fun but I missed playing the songs that my friends and I wrote 30 years ago yeah. so I assembled uh, one lineup of the band COVID hit and people went their separate ways and I put together another lineup last year and we started rehearsing right after Christmas okay. so I'm thinking we're we're gonna be starting to gig 
in about a month or so. You know, you have to do the obligatory uh, electronic press kit. And we're hopefully going to go into the studio in about three weeks and cut two or three songs. Um, here in the States, a lot of, um, a lot of bar owners, club owners want to hear music they know. Yeah. So we'll, we'll cover something. I mean, we're throwing around all different kinds of ideas, everything from April wine to, I would love to take a, um, a 70s song that wasn't a rock song and turn it into one. We used to mess around, um, with the Duran Duran song, Hungry Like the Wolf. Oh, okay. And make it a hard rock song. And we turned it into a medley from, we went from Bang and Gong into Hungry Like the Wolf. They're in the same key. They're in the same tempo. Yeah. So it, uh, it was kind of cool and it went over very well. This was a long time ago. So we want to take a song like that um, and turn it into, you know, something kind of like what Van Halen did with You Really Got Me. Yeah. You know, it, it, rec it just as recognizable as the Kinks version, but really different. Yeah. That'd be awesome. That'd be a good crossover. I would like to hear that. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I, I actually, um, I'll send you some audio of a previous incarnation of this band doing it. And it's, it, it's a lot of fun. It's not broadcast quality. So, you know, it's not anything someone's going to go, wow, that sounds great. And da, 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 da. But, you know, you can get a, an idea of it. I, I've got it and it gets a lot of laughs. Yeah, no, I'm doing with that. I'm absolutely doing with that. So, you know, obviously, hopefully some gigs coming up fairly soon, and that's pretty decent. And where, where about it's online is the best place for people to find you? The, the best place is the Facebook page. Okay. Uh, Facebook.com forward slash Fast Susie. Um, Fast and Susie, there's no gap between the two. Facebook okay. doesn't like gaps. So, yeah. Um, FastSusie.com is the website. It is being overhauled right now. And um, because of Facebook, we're on Instagram, uh, we're on Twitter. We are about set to bombard with a whole bunch of different things. We're, um, we're pretty fortunate that we have a decent number of followers on the Facebook page, which, you know, it, it, it's, it's really great to see, especially when it's people you're not related to or that you don't already know. Yeah. So, you know, his family can only come to so many gigs um, <laughs> <True that. laughs> before they want to get paid for it. Yeah, um, pretty much. But, uh, you know, that it's going to be a busy mid to end of summer for us um, awesome. because I'm, I'm very comfortable with the idea that the music will be well received. There are people that do remember the very first incarnation of this band back in 1989. And, um, you know, I, I feel like I'm, I, I, what I want to do is carry a torch with a nod to the past and honor it because um, I'm very proud of it, but not get bogged down in it where it becomes a tribute to myself. Yeah, I don't want to spend to myself. Myself. Yeah. I don't want, I don't want that. Um, we're not going to do the whole catalog. I think we've, we've picked on like four songs and Dennis's previous band. Um, you can find them on, um, on YouTube, the band name is Black Arrow. Really different, but um, you know we're going to do a couple of his that we've really kind of thrown in the blender and mixed it up and made it ours. Kind of like I was telling you about Hungry Like the Wolf. Yeah, and um, yeah, and I've got, like I said uh, earlier, I've got 35, 40 song ideas. Today is writing day. I'm going to uh, I'm going to lock myself in the basement and. Uh, try to work out a little more of at least a couple of these songs to move forward. Well, that's cool. Get the, get the do not disturb sign on and uh, <laughs> have at it. No, that's well, cool. uh, you know, the, the sheer volume of the guitars is enough to, you know, to scare the family away. The, the, the one to worry about is the dog because she likes to just kind of, you know, be in front of and around everything. So, yeah. you know, she's, she's small enough. Fortunately, she's only 13 pounds. Um, that I can put her in like a playpen and she'll be fine. Put a couple of snacks, a little bit of peanut butter in a bowl and she'll be happy. Seems so, like a, an ideal Saturday yeah. afternoon for most people in fairness, you know? <laughs> yeah, well, I know I have friends that probably would be okay with being put in a playpen with peanut butter. Same up. <laughs> yeah, you know, in my case, it needs to be at least a, a, a gallon of coffee. So, 
Um, but uh, yeah, today is today is uh, um, writing day. I'm actually very excited that I don't get things are things are always busy, um, and uh, it's nice to be able to just sit back and, and be creative rather than um, worry about the mechanics of songs. We're we're working through the set list right now and trying different combinations. And I've literally been listening to songs, recorded versions and putting them together in the playlist and just letting it run and go, no, that's not going to work. Let's shift yeah. this around. Yeah. So it, um, uh, you know, it's, it's nice to actually sit down and, and be creative and, um, I'll spend a little time trying to cop a few more Gary Moore licks. That's, that's the other challenge today. That's, that's pretty decent. Yeah, I, I the the man just is amazing. Um, I'm trying to convince the guys that it would be okay to do an instrumental in the set, provided it doesn't bore people. But I really, um, it's not instrumental, but I really want to do Parisian walkways. And I have spent a lot of time learning what Gary's done, and I still cannot fathom the speed. Um, and it, it's mind blowing. So I, I do literally sit down. What I practice is a lot of uh, the hammer ons and pull offs that he does with his first and second fingers, you yeah. know, um, where I'm used to playing with my ring finger. Yeah. And, you know, in order to accomplish the note selection like he did, um, you have to use the middle finger. So, um, you know, that's, a, that's fun too. Um, you know, when I get a little, a little bit faster and a little bit cleaner, that's a lot of fun. But that's my day. It's gloomy here in Chicago today. So it's the it's, same here uh, in Glasgow, but it's just the same, same as always here in Glasgow. <laughs> yeah, well, we're sharing <laughs> the same weather. Um, I, uh, I usually say it's like, it's like Seattle because Seattle's the same way. Yeah. It's usually cloudy. It's a little, you know, it's gloomy and rainy, and that's what it is. That's what today is. But I'll take this over. Last week we had snow, so. I'll uh, I'll take this over snow right now anytime. No, fair play. Well, mm -hmm. let me say again, very grateful again, Matt, that you've obviously like taken the time to join us today and support uh, what we're doing. So thank you very, very much for that. And obviously encourage everyone to have a little look online and check out Fast Susie. And anyone in the area, stay tuned for gigs that will be coming up as well. I'll go out your here and let you get get to those roughs, man. You take care. Okay? All right. Thanks so much. See you, man. Take care.